Well, first, um, a broader Kickstarter to frame our conversation. So Tom, taking the DSA aside a bit, how would you explain in abstract the idea of using mandatory audits to tackle problems in the digital policy world? Is it something close to their use uh, to over oversight and evaluate processes that exist before DSA uh, in other fields? Uh, in your opinion, so in your opinion, those ideas of bringing audits to this sphere were inspired by any particular field or regulation, regulation or practice. And uh, uh, um, just to to bring something to the table, would you ex how do you you would explain the role or inspiration that the United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights have? on bringing this new idea for oversight for platforms? Um, that's the complex question. And I should say as well that, um, so my background is in um, law and public policy, but not necessarily in um, sort of other areas of audit. So my interaction with this area of audit and understanding audit frameworks has mainly been in the context of our work as project lead for the Action Coalition on Meaningful Transparency, as you know, which has been focused on transparency by tech companies um, and the role of audit frameworks under the Digital Services Act is something that's going to be implemented. Um, I have heard um so based on my experience having discussions with various experts about the role of audit and where the idea has come from in a tech company space um i think there has been a long-standing expectation from civil society and regulators that when companies are publishing information about how they are dealing with content moderation issues or other kinds of things that are included in transparency reports. Sometimes there are questions that people have about how those numbers are created. Um, and there's all kinds of issues as well in terms of um, comparing data, even between transparency reports from the same company. And the metaphor here is, um, you know, comparing apples with apples rather than apples with oranges. So there might be a statistic um, and you want to compare two percentages, but it's difficult to understand how that number was created. So it's difficult to have confidence in your comparison. So as I understand it, the role of audit is essentially just to um, take a statement by a company about um, how they are dealing with certain kinds of content or other matters and to establish that there is a good faith basis for that statement. So um, the way I understand how audits work is essentially there's a public statement by a company that um, I've complied with this thing and then you have an independent third party say, I've seen the process that has been used to confirm that you comply with this thing and I, I back it. I, I have a, a reasonable degree of assurance, for example, that it's, um, it's a reliable statement. And obviously the broader context for that is in financial reporting. And I think it's interesting that the European Commission has compared the DSA on multiple occasions to banking regulation. So the, the metaphor is that um, these companies are so big and so important and their communications and commercial infrastructure is so important that they're almost sort of too big to fail. And um, they really need to be carefully checked in terms of how they're operating and their, their impact on fundamental human rights needs to be assessed. The role of audits is essentially to say, 
as I've heard it described, that companies can't mark their own homework. So um, if they are reporting, then they need somebody else to confirm that the reporting is, has been done in a useful way and complied with various kinds of, of legal obligations. Um, the role of audit is an interesting one because uh, I'm not an expert in audit going back a long time, but it's interesting to hear auditors describe what an audit is. And essentially, it's just an independent third-party assessment. And I think if you think of audits in that way, then you can see that there are independent third-party assessments being included in a range of different platform regulation frameworks, including in New Zealand. And it's a, it's, it seems to be a pretty core part of, of how platform regulation is going to work. I think one other thing about audits that's very interesting to me is the level of transparency that it creates. So I think when you see um, discussion papers from civil society groups, for example, and they list all of the things that they would like companies to disclose. So, you know, how algorithmic systems work, how many staff they have, um, when you see lists from people about what they would like companies to disclose, they are very long detailed lists about how algorithmic systems work, how, how, um, how many staff they have, all kinds of things. Um, there are lots of barriers to disclosing that information and a huge amount of detail, but through these independent audit frameworks, you have a trusted third party who can go into a company and ask questions. Uh, they can require documents. They can look at, at, at a huge level of detail um, at some of the things that companies are doing. So I, I think audits are one of the strongest transparency measures that are being created, even though they don't necessarily result in the disclosure of a lot of information to the public. So there is a lot of information that goes to the auditors, uh, but it, uh, even if that is not um, information that is made public. Perfect. So let's go deeper on, into the DSA. In your perspective, and of course, recognizing that the term audit appears with apparent different meanings in the Digital Services Act, how would you explain the DSA's provisions or provision of mandatory audits to confront problems of online platforms and search engines. So to be more straightforward, what is your reading about what exactly people in the policy circles at Brussels think when they are talking about auditing platforms as a part of this piece of legislation? And of course, what choices in those specific provisions, like Article 37, do you think are connected to European perspectives or European specific concerns? Mm. Um, there seems to be a consensus among auditors, the European Commission and civil society, including, um, you know, uh, human rights risk assessment professionals that what the DSA is creating is a new kind of audit. So it's it's not um, it's not an audit that is uh, seen elsewhere. It's it's a it's a brand new type of thing. Um, there is a lot of opportunity to learn from existing frameworks. However, there is also a lot of um, design being done to work out how these things are going to work for the first time. The way that audits work under the DSA is that auditors, so professional audit firms, are potentially working in uh, consortiums, so working in groups with other kinds of professionals, will audit companies against their legal obligations 
So there are the, the various articles of the DSA and very large online platforms and very large online search engines will be audited to see whether they comply with those legal obligations. As I understand it, that's quite different to how auditing works normally. Normally, you will have um, a series of quite clear benchmarks that you can say with a lot of certainty whether a company has complied or not. Whereas because of the way that the DSA is drafted, um, there is some uncertainty as to what it means to actually comply with the DSA. So for an auditor to say you have complied or you haven't complied is very difficult because compliance can be something that is that is not that clear. For example, there might be an obligation to balance a range of fundamental human rights and comply within a reasonable time frame. So that's not um, a very clear line that you can audit against. It's going to require the company or somebody else to say, this is what we understand compliance to mean, and here's how we comply with our understanding of it. So it's very much a new kind of audit. Uh, which is causing some difficulties for people, I think. Uh, I would. My understanding is that there would be a lot of merit in having multi-stakeholder processes that try to make it more clear what the benchmarks for compliance with the DSA would look like. So I would like to see that happen and like to be a part of that exercise. There, I think the specific sort of um, European assumptions that sit behind the DSA are really interesting. Um, A few features to consider would be um, the European Commission has said on multiple occasions that the DSA can't be looked at in isolation. The DSA sits within a broader constitutional structure that relies on the Charter of Fundamental Human Rights as well. So it's kind of impossible to take the DSA without also understanding the European Charter on Fundamental Human Rights because they're part of a package. I think that's important because... um, if you were to pick up and pick up the DSA and drop it in another area without those fundamental human rights protections, then it would create um, a lot of risk to human rights. One of the other areas that I see as being relatively um, European focused, I suppose, is if I think about uh, New Zealand, we will have um, some provision for independent assessment of things produced by companies. So at the moment, we're, we're looking at this in the context of a proposed platform regulation uh, legislation that will be coming in at far in the future, um, next year, if, if at all. But that will also rely on codes of practice and there is an existing um, industry-led code of practice in New Zealand. And the point is that both the proposed legislation and the self-regulation both include scope for independent assessment. So independent assessments are something that is being replicated in New Zealand. Um, To do independent assessments in the way that the DSA requires requires a professional audit firm working with a group of professionals who are very scarce. So one of the other things is that the kinds of people who have the skills to look at company systems in a in an operational sense, look at policies and procedures, look at data, look at machine learning systems is a very small group of people. And so it's going to be quite hard to find just the um, the the people required to do this. And that's something that came through in, in discussions with the Action Coalition. And another feature is that um, 
the resources required to perform an audit in the way required by the DSA might make sense in Europe for companies that have 45 million users in the European Union. But in New Zealand, for example, the threshold that is being considered is 100,000 users. So a, a really clear difference. And it would be very hard to justify conducting a DSA type audit for a market that may be at maximum 4 million users if, if you had most of New Zealand uh, signed up to, to it. So I think um, the interaction with fundamental human rights charters is one component. And then the second is, I think, um, assumptions about the level of resourcing that are justified in terms of how this will work, as well as um, access to people who can do the work required. I think those are things that perhaps are taken for, for um taken for granted in the European Union that might not apply elsewhere. And who will be the auditors under the DSA? Uh, not only who will be, who should be the auditors under the DSA. Can you speculate a bit and give your opinion about uh, who this auditor character should be? Uh, and will be in what type of company or organization will fulfill this role. And, and also, how should the registration slash accreditation of organizations uh, should, should take place? And, and if you believe uh, that civil society should have a role on it. So it's a um, multiple question, uh, but all... The, the question is is driven towards uh, understanding uh, the multiple roles and characters that are going to interact under this provision. Yeah, um, in a European context, um, there are obligations to find an organization that is independent, um, that is subject to obligations of professional secrecy, uh, and that has systems that are capable of maintaining the confidentiality required, given that auditors will have extraordinary access to very sensitive commercial information. So I think the expectation in Europe is that large audit firms such as I think the big four or the big six will be the um, organizations performing these audits. Um, because the type of audit is relatively new, they are not necessarily enthusiastic, I think about performing these audits because there is a lot of work involved and a lot of risk too. So as I understand it, and, and again, um, a lot of these insights have come from other people through the Action Coalition. So I'm just, I'm just parroting what I've heard. Um, the, Um, the audit firms will have to be uh, designing these audit processes and then will also be accountable for what they say. So audit firms carry risk from performing audits. And so um, it's very important that they feel confident in, in being able to express their conclusions. So it's not as if um, the audit firms are necessarily lining up to perform these audits, even though they are probably the only ones that could do it. One of the really interesting things that came out of the delegated regulation on audit under the DSA was an expectation that there may need to be consortiums performing these audits. So audit firms may need to work with other specialist organizations. I think there is scope for working with civil society organizations in there. One of the difficulties is that um, 
if an organization wanted to partner with an audit firm or an audit firm wanted to partner with an external organization, there are very stringent independence and conflict of interest and secrecy obligations. So this, the level of trust and confidence and legal arrangements required to, to form those kinds of consortiums is very high. And I think um, these kinds of organizations are not necessarily used to working together. And so it will be really interesting to see whether that is possible and what kinds of organizations will be prepared to enter those kinds of consortiums. Um, I can't remember what, there was another part to your question, oh, accreditation and civil society input. So accreditation is going to be a difficult one. Um, personally, I think that the, the companies have been under a lot of scrutiny until now. Um, I think a lot of that scrutiny is going to start to turn towards the auditors. So the companies will put out their risk assessments. The auditors will be obliged to say whether those risk assessments are reliable. And so I think the attention of a lot of people is going to start to turn on to the audit firms. And I, I think that will be quite uncomfortable for them, but I think they may be the next um, villains in the space, the next bad guys, which is appropriate. You know, they, they should be um, uh, tested to make sure that they are independent and, and rigorous. Um, but again, that will be, um, that'll be an interesting thing to watch. There are um, really significant independence obligations, and one of the ones under the Arctic, under the DSA also relates to um, not being able to provide non-audit services as well. So many of the same companies may be involved in providing consultancy services or similar, or they may even be outsourcing of various um, uh, internal functions to the companies. And one of the other things that I'm sure the companies are considering is um, the revenue and risk associated with audits on the one hand, and the revenue and risk associated with being able to provide non-audit services. And um, I'm not sure what that looks like, but it, it may be that it's quite unattractive to provide audits and instead you'd prefer to continue providing consultancy services. And civil society uh, is in this difficult place of having to collaborate with those four, six large firms and that have never interacted continuously with it, right? Like this is this is the under the DSA, this is the uncomfortable role of the of civil society. So pl please like comment on that. Like how, how civil society is reacting to that and, and how how do you understand those reactions? Um, the, I think this is a really interesting topic that applies to transparency more generally. So there have been calls for transparency for a long time, and now the DSA is going to produce an extraordinary amount of information and the European Commission has said on multiple occasions that it won't be able to, to do this alone. It's going to need civil society support to um, help it turn its attention to areas that most need scrutiny. So as I see it, there's going to be um, this big wave of information coming out about all of these companies, particularly the very large ones, but then also the small ones. Um, and the expectation will be that civil society organizations and researchers can look at that and use it to hold the companies accountable. That takes a really long time. Um, it's, it's very complicated work. And as you've pointed out, I think, to, to do an independent assessment of transparency reports, for example, 
Um, this is something that is is considered under the the New Zealand code of practice that has been created. Really requires you know understanding of global human rights principles, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, um, what the companies are doing in other jurisdictions, um, what they've done in previous years, um, comparing and contrasting the different materials um, in, in this way. And I think that's a very difficult task. I think it's a very um, specialist task, but there doesn't seem to be any um, sort of planning for where the resourcing for that is going to come from. So um, I think that's a real risk for meaningful transparency. I think um, there's a real risk that it will sort of be like, um, you ask for transparency, now you've got transparency, up to you what you're going to do with it. And there'll be an assumption that there's no problem when actually it's just impossible to keep up with all of the information required. So I would really like to see um, whether it's the companies or whether it's the commission or governments start to proactively plan how they're going to support civil society to deal with this volume of information. And one of the other points that people make in this, in this space is um, if we think about the volume of information under the DSA, that's one thing, but then there's also other regulation in the European Union. So the Digital Markets Act, the AI Act, um, other sort of corporate social responsibility directives, that's just the European Union. Then, for example, there's going to be other countries following the DSA, like Brazil, like New Zealand. Um, so that, you know, the, the level, it's not just the DSA we have to think about if we want to think about the human rights compliance and, and legal compliance of tech companies. It's also um, other jurisdictions too. And, you know, that's, that's to say nothing of keeping an eye on government as well and how government is, um, is is dealing with these things and how it's using that information. You touched on subject of human rights and our next question is about standards. So how about the standards and procedures? And, and the main question here is, can those be similar in structure to the ones that are adopted by the traditional big auditing firms, even though we're talking about obligations that have strong grounds on human rights language and no established standards and metrics. And, and like for, from a human rights perspective, there's a key place, for example, for stakeholder engagement, especially in marginalized communities as a way of mapping risks and impacts. So from a perspective of form, function, content, how how should these standards and metrics be developed? And what are the challenges that we can anticipate from, from this project, from this process? I think that is probably the most challenging area at the moment for successful implementation of the DSA. Uh, and, and there's this other question of, um, how the DSA will be implemented, but then also how we can have standards that to the extent possible work in multiple jurisdictions as well. Because the, um, so what I mean is we could have standards and procedures for implementing the DSA, but there will be certain areas where it makes sense for the standards to be the same in different countries. Um, there is suggestion that there should be a modular approach adopted and that's um, some work that we've looked at in the Action Coalition done by uh, Chris Riley and Susan Ness and I'm really interested to explore that further because I think uh, particularly for New Zealand we're such a small company, a uh, small country and a small market that we really need to be participating in those processes if we want to have a big impact because our own legislation just won't be that persuasive 
um, to the companies, I think, given the size of our markets. So I think there's a really good opportunity for countries to consider um, participating in the creation of, of those standards and procedures as a means of uh, soft power, basically. Um, so I think that's going to be very important. I don't have great familiarity with the way existing audit standards work, but my understanding is that the kinds of standards that will be required under the DSA will look quite different from existing audit standards. So it's going to be a real challenge to try and replicate those. And like I said at the start, because the audit process is so different, I think it will need a, a completely different kind of uh, standard. I, I understand that there have been various standards bodies that have been working on content moderation and trust and safety standards for some time, at least a year, I imagine. Um, and so I'm quite interested to see how far they have got because if they've been working on it for some time and they're professional standards bodies, and haven't come up with something that that looks credible, then that's probably a pretty strong signal of how difficult this exercise is. Um, I think when it comes to standard setting processes, my understanding is that they are not normally designed to incorporate civil society input. So that is going to be have have to be something that is is learnt and developed. Um, the other co component of that will be whether civil society organizations can effectively engage with those processes, given uh, perhaps lack of understanding about how they work and also the resourcing required to participate in those, uh, particularly if they, they're operating at a global level across multiple frameworks. Again, that's, that's very complicated stuff. Um, we did some work recently with the with uh, GNI and the Digital Trust and Safety Partnership on uh, implementation of risk assessments and published a discussion summary from that. And one of the interesting things that came through in that discussion summary uh, related to how far stakeholder engagement processes under human rights uh, assessment uh, mechanisms are similar to those under the DSA. And I think there, the conclusion expressed by some people there was that there, there is um, a high degree of similarity between the stakeholder engagement expectations under, for example, the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights and the stakeholder engagement expectations under the DSA. So um, stakeholder engagement would be something that, that really needs to be um, implemented alongside any kind of um, audit or risk assessment processes. Um, and there's a really good body of practice and guidance out there already on how to do this effectively. Although actually doing it effectively is, is a real challenge as well. So um, that shouldn't be underestimated. So I think these standards and procedures are going to be very, very important. I think it's gonna be a real challenge to, um, to do those processes well. And I think at the moment, there's also a question about who or what organization should be leading that. Uh, and I haven't heard many um, suggestions about who could be doing that. That's something that we would like to support uh, as uh, within the Action Coalition, if possible. And I do think a multi-stakeholder approach is, is important. And um, there's, all, there's other kinds of organizations like GNI that have been managing multi-stakeholder processes for a long time. So it's important to make sure that we're learning from that experience too. In keeping in this conversation about standards, you, you in your response, you, you talked about soft power. And maybe we can dig a little bit on that. Um, talking a bit on how would you see the global impact of these provisions for auditing uh, in the light of the so-called Brussels effect, which of course refers to the fact that this act can be inspiring the creation of new regulation 
um, overseas. Do you think that the, the European provision and the European standards following the provisions would influence the field and create room and markets for others that will plug and play? Uh, so do you think that this consolidation driven by Europe would create, for example, barriers to auditing standards um, that may not include, for example, and may not listen to different realities, to different stakeholders, to more decentralized ways of doing. So for example, if, Brazil's, if Brazil delays too much to build its standards, to build its provisions, uh, will, uh, would, would we, uh, um, would, would we, at the end, uh, have to rely on the standards, the consolidated standards of Europe, and not having the opportunity for for creating things at home. So, uh, how you how you see this this discussion uh, taking into account, of course, that there is some value in consolidation. So, having standards is important for going forward. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, this is something I'm interested in, um, again, with, with reference to our experience in New Zealand. So um, the so in New Zealand, the, there's a, a group of companies along with a civil society organization called NetSafe who have developed what's called the Aotearoa New Zealand Code of Practice of Online Safety and Harms. And that was presented to civil society uh, in, in kind of draft form with a relatively short turnaround period for consultation. Um, and there was a lot of concern from some civil society organizations that this had had really been presented as something that was finished already without any meaningful opportunity for input from civil society organizations as to how it was developed. Um, obviously the code of practice is, is not quite the same as a set of audit standards, but it is similar in the sense that it's something that sits below legislation uh, and does create a set of rules that are applied in, in multiple different, uh, could be applied in different jurisdictions. My own take is that there's a lot of good in the code as it, in the way that it's been developed, but it has been developed in a way that doesn't really include the same kind of democratic input that you might expect in other kinds of law. So we are sort of already in this situation where um, a code of practice has been developed based on the European code of practice on disinformation and based on the Australian code of practice um, around online harms and sort of presented to us as being um, something that, that is ready to go. So I would say that um, similar processes will result in situations where people are presented with standards that they don't feel that they had uh, an opportunity for meaningful input into them. I think it's important to say that that doesn't necessarily mean that the standards or the code aren't good. So um, it is useful in some ways to have a starting point for discussion. So for example, the fact that the code's been presented here means that we can comment on it, we can make suggestions for improvements um, and things like that. But I think there is a sense that the capacity for really big changes is quite limited. Um, so we're in a situation now where we are sort of being presented with this code and, and we sort of have to accept it or not. Um, interestingly, the signatories to the code have already said that they are in discussions with other countries too about adopting similar codes. Uh, off the top of my head, I believe they're having discussions with Japan, Sri Lanka, and Indonesia, and I think a couple of other countries too. 
So there is this this thing going on where standards are being created uh, to some degree and then being sort of given to to countries to to broadly accept. But like I say, there is some degree of commonality that needs to exist in order for the platforms to operate um, globally. So to some degree, you sort of have to accept that there will be some similarities and and if you want to be effective then some things sort of can't be changed as well so so it's a tricky balance there um i think um many countries will want to take advantage of a kind of plug and play approach and i think that's because designing platform regulation is quite difficult um i think in new zealand um officials have found it difficult to not only capture um, a huge amount of community input and community expectations while also establishing what New Zealand needs from its own platform regulation while also taking account of global developments and certain minimum expectations about how these things will work. So we very much do sit and watch what other people are doing and then we try to take the best bits from from other countries so to some degree that plug and play approach is um is beneficial it's not necessarily a bad thing but it does it does result in a risk that um there isn't meaningful democratic input into the design of those systems uh, and i do think that's a trade-off of of some of the consolidation i think as well um, it's important that platform regulation stuff doesn't move too fast. So it's important to um, act and not be left behind. But at the same time, I think that can be used as a justification by governments for ramming stuff through too fast. And I think that undermines trust and confidence and it fuels suspicion um, that it is some kind of illegitimate attempt to undermine freedom of expression rather than um, something else. So so I'm also really cautious about anything that says that we need to move fast, otherwise we'll be left behind, because I think that can be a justification for um, bad lawmaking. Um, you, you gave the, the hint for, for the last two questions that we have that are about trust and confidence um, and also the, the asymmetries that, that we have uh, and that, ha that you have already outlined on, on the last one. So among others, a key question that is always present in regulatory debates transposed to other realities is how to understand the different dynamics in those realities and here, uh, when we are talking about audit, we are, when you, we are talking about audit firms, uh, we are talking about the role of the economic power, especially multinational corporations and firms. Uh, is it possible to assert, uh, for example, here in Brazil, that many of these auditing firms are much more already intertwined with Alphabet and Meta abroad then close to the discussion around regulation in non-EU or non-US realities. And this is particularly important when connected to the previous discussions around uh, human rights due diligence. So how do, you, how do you make about this discussion around economic power and multinational corporations in an asymmetric economic context? Uh, don't you think that if it's uncomfortable for civil society organizations in the European Union, uh, and we are here talking about rich countries, isn't it too far, too far away for grassroots organizations in an equal con context to have contact with, with those firms and develop work with them? Can we say that those firms would be suited to conduct stakeholder engagement, take th taking this into account, taking this whole picture into account. Um, of course, this is a more broad question, but if we are transplanting or importing this kind of provision, uh, um, we should take the context into account, right? Um, 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think um, there is a real issue with large multinational companies or, or any organization that is based in one context attempting to meaningfully lead stakeholder engagement in another context. Um, and I think about that a lot in my own work and my own position as well. And there's really no substitute, I think, for authentic community leadership on this. Um, so I think that has to be the starting point. Um, I do think that it will be very difficult for organizations in the global north or minority world to meaningfully engage with organizations in the global south or majority world. And I do think that's going to be a real issue. And I think, as I mentioned before, and as you, you raised, the kind of economic asymmetries is, is, a, really, is a really big deal. Um, there's the economic, and then there's also... Um, there's other things too, like I'm always really struck um, when dealing with civil society organizations based in America and the EU, uh, how many of them are constantly in contact with each other and know each other very well uh, and all understand exactly what's going on in various ways. Um, but it's very difficult, I think, for them to share that information. And it's very difficult to access it if you don't have a way into those communities. Um, that's something that we're trying to address through the Action Coalition Transparency Initiatives portal that we're developing. I think that'll be a great resource for showing what these different networks are and um, what is already happening in the space and being able to sort of map what's going on. So we're really excited to, to put, put that out as, as a useful resource for people. Um, the, I wanted to come back as well to this, in this issue of um, transposing regulatory frameworks into contexts without, without being careful about how it's being done. One example that really sticks out to me is in the European Union, um, there has been a long uh, focus on the use of internet referral units and trusted flaggers. So situations where external organizations, including governments, can flag violating content to platforms. Um, that issue is getting a lot of attention in the United States at the moment as well with some of the litigation that's happening. And one thing that I've, I've noticed about New Zealand is... Um, I think when governments are proposing platform regulation, just for whatever reason, they're very unlikely to um, transpose things that put obligations on them or limit their own power. So one really big um, glaring absence in New Zealand's proposal is around trusted flagger oversight and, and quality assurance. So we know that there are sort of referrals that happen in New Zealand, but it's kind of a, a pretty glaring omission that um, we've sort of pulled bits from overseas legislation, but we haven't pulled the trusted flagger stuff, you know? So I think that's, um, that's things like that do sort of undermine trust and confidence, I think, in um, the way that governments are approaching these things. And they are a good example of, be, having to take the whole framework, not just just individual provisions. Um, yeah, I, th I think the issue that you flagged here about asymmetry and sort of um, the need to establish better global links that actually result in authentic um, design that account for local conditions is a really big one. And I think it's something that we're going to see a lot of. I personally see a lot of benefit in um, working around governments, um, working across international borders, having conversations like this, sharing knowledge in ways that's effective um, to sort of give everyone else a heads up about what you might like to look out for.
um, and trying to to get a degree of agreement on things. So I'm I'm really um, enthusiastic about growing those links um, going forward because I think it's going to be very important. So we're heading to the last one, and and the last one is is also about trust, but I think it's about a an even more shadowy uh, side of it, um, which is credibility. Here in Brazil, for example, just a few months ago, we witnessed what was considered the biggest corporate fraud in our history uh, with a huge retailing store uh, that, that disclosed an accounting fraud with an estimate loss of $10 billion. Uh, this case, with great national repercussions, uh, generate a huge distrust, uh, not only in this company, but also in external audits uh, with big firms involved. In contexts like this, how we can uh, think about audits in platform regulation? So... If we are going to bring this uh, to our world, to the digital policy world, are we bringing those kind of problems? Uh, are any guardrails that we can bring alongside uh, the idea of auditing that can protect us for, from this kind of thing, which is of course, when two huge companies uh, start to mingle too much with each other and mingle too much with, the, with their economic interests and, and the ones who would be independent third parties turned into, uh, can turn into cover-up uh, partners. So how do you think about that? Yeah. Um... As we were talking before, I was also thinking about the recent example in Australia, uh, where uh, I can't remember the name of the company, but essentially one of the companies, as I understand it, was both um, providing advice on tax policy to the Australian federal government, while one of the partners was also disclosing that information to the companies that were meant to be subject to those tax proposals, which I think included some of the technology companies too. That's just my recollection of, of the news. I might've got that wrong. Um, so yeah, I, I think you're right to identify that trust issue. Um, I'm, I think the lawyers would just say, well, we just need you know more legal agreements um, you know, more independence requirements, more disclosure requirements. Um, obviously, those things don't always work. Um, and when they don't work, um, trust is damaged. Um, to some extent, I suppose that's unavoidable. There will always be um, breaches of the law and failures and fraud. So... To some extent, maybe we just have to acknowledge that and and deal with the consequences where we do identify it. Um, but yeah, that that's very much a relevant consideration. Um, I think it would be new territory for... Uh, I mean, I'm not sure. I don't have a good sense of whether the companies that would be performing these audits are used to trying to build trust and confidence with community organizations or civil society. In some situations, they do provide sort of stakeholder engagement and management services. So it's not impossible that actually they could be very good at it. I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, I think sometimes governments are very, very bad at stakeholder engagement too. So I don't want to rule out the prospect that um, it could, could be great, you know, could be great to have these audit firms doing this work um, if they do a proper job of it. Um, but at the same time, I think that sort of speaks to this need maybe for new kinds of organizations that can perform these services and they just do one thing, you know, they don't do everything. They just specialize in providing these kinds of 
assurance um, and audit services. Um, I think that is probably where things are heading mainly because the areas of expertise are so rare. You know, you've sort of got the um, the organisational expertise and how large organisations work. You've got the legal, you've got the technical. Um, I think what would be great is to see specialist organisations created that are designed to build trust and confidence and transparency in the way that they do these things. Um, I suspect there are a lot of people thinking about about building those. And I read recently about, for example, the growth in um, trust and safety outsourcing companies, you know, coming out of um, TrustCon uh, and the number of, of sort of companies that, that were there offering uh, trust and safety as a service. So... I think, um, yeah, that trust and confidence thing is a big one. I'm sure if I if I predicted what would happen, we would identify issues with that. The question would be what we do to build trust and confidence afterwards when they're identified. And the alternative would be that you have specialist organizations that grow up to meet this meet this need, which I think would be really interesting to see. So you're reaching the end of our conversation. Uh, and, and I think we're pretty much covered all of the subjects that we wanted to and, and with very interesting insights. Um, I think this conversation will keep us thinking about that for, for some weeks, some more than days for sure. Uh, and, and ending that, what we, are, we wanted to ask you is if you have anything to add, like what, what's your recommendation? for digesting the, the DSA provisions um, in realities that are not Europe and that are not the US. Um, so final comments. It is, it's difficult, isn't it, to keep up with the volume of um, legislation proposals in the DSA. Um, <sighs> I, I think it's reassuring to hear that um, if you have a lot of, if you or anyone else has a lot of questions but not a lot of answers, that the companies and regulators also seem to have a lot of questions but not a lot of answers. So I find it quite comforting um, when we have action coalition discussions um, to talk to people whose um, experience and expertise is, is I really admire. And they don't have the answers either. Um, so I think that is something to, to, to bear in mind. Um, I'm personally really interested in how we can make um, legislation more accessible by making it more um, easy to use in a sort of digital sense. So that's something that Brainbox is exploring, um, how you can create sort of machine structured marked up versions of legislation that make it much easier to access that's something that we're working on in the background um but yeah there's just a lot out there i think i think having discussions with people and um i don't know about you but it's always better to hear key insights from somebody in the course of like an hour-long conversation than it is to try and <laughs> sit down with like a hundred pages of legislation and try to understand it all. So I think that's, um, I think that's an important component of all this as well as, is how do we have these networks where we can share learning in ways that is, um, which is useful and, and equally, um, you know, uh, bi-directional too. So um, it's really important that it's not just um, the EU and the DSA sharing information in one direction, it also needs to be, um, they need to be learning in the other direction too. Thank you so much, Tom. So um, I think this conversation was fantastic. So thank you so Great. much. Thanks very so, much.